evolution here we have clearly you know this man is Darwin uh, another important scientist in the story of evolution is Alfred Russell Wallace I want to put his name in there he came up with the idea at the same time of Darwin as Darwin but he didn't have uh, the uh, gravitas and he was as famous as Darwin at the time so Wallace um, contributed his paper and they got together a little bit uh, but it's mostly Darwin that's known for evolution and Darwin is the person who explained why we see all these amazing colors and all this variety and like you see in these fishes here swimming in this um, near this coral reef it looks like so if you preview the understandings um, it's five actually five basic lines of evidence that we have for evolution um, one is fossils Okay, so fossils have been found um, the last two, three hundred years, and what they show for us is that we can change over time. We see, for example, uh, horses, and we'll get into that later, horses, uh, armadillo fossils, and we see how they s s slightly change over time as we dig them up. and for a while geologists have, have established that the deeper you go the older you get in time in the earth and it can be shown that uh, earlier forms of these different animals um, and plants show that they're simpler less sophisticated less complex um, another thing another line of evidence is selective breeding Selective breeding, and also known as this is known as artificial selection. And basically, that is when humans breed animals together. How uh, we make sure certain chickens breed together, certain dogs breed together, certain plants breed together, and we can change them in a short amount of time. We can see, wow, if this happened over five, ten years, a hundred years, think if you had a hundred million years, how much change you can see. Another line of evidence is homologous structures. And what homologous structures are is structures that are similar in uh, in shape, uh, but they're suited to the, they're actually being used for different purposes. And what we can see. Uh, it's called pentadactyl limbs. So, pentadactyl limbs. So, in uh, whales, humans, uh, fishes, uh, cats, dogs, our arm is all made up of the same basic bones, but they're just different shapes and sizes. Um, so showing over time evolution doesn't completely throw out what's already there it modifies what's working already to come up with a, uh, a design that's um, that's well suited um, another we see patterns and variation patterns and variation And the best way to think about this is the Galapagos finches, or some people call them Darwin's finches. So these finches uh, spread out amongst uh, the different islands in the Galapagos, and since each island has slightly different ecology, different food source, um, the birds basically develop slightly different beaks that were best adapted to exploit that food source on each island. So it's showing how these animals can change over time. Um, and also another similar thing that is shown by the Galapagos is speciation. And scientists still have been, they've been going back to the Galapagos um, because it's still a great place to study evolution. Also, lizards, amazing marine iguana there that, uh, unlike any other iguana on Earth, can swim deep uh, and dive deep in the water, not, you know, 20, 30, 40, 50 feet, 
to uh, graze on algae and plants that are growing in the water. Uh, speciation. So this would be you know new species coming about. Okay, so the basic overview. So we know heritable, which means you can pass them on from parent to offspring. Parent to offspring. So we know that, you know, if we look at parents and their offspring, you know, there's some similarities. Not always, you know, some offspring look more like their parents than others, but usually you can see a resemblance right there. Um, another point here is acquired characteristics can change. So acquired, so things that you develop during um, your lifetime. Um, and the primary way that all this evolution happens is natural selection, so the primary mechanism. So how does it work? Through natural selection. Okay, that's what drives evolution. That was really the, the genius, the, 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 um, the, the main uh, driving principle that Darwin wrote about in his uh, on the origin of species. And the main reason why evolution, I'm sure we've talked about, you know, the controversial nature of it, because it does conflict with creation. However, we'll get into, you know, good discussions later. It doesn't really, you know, any kind of fundamental religious idea about how the world became what it is, is actually very similar to the Big Bang Theory. And of course, the only thing that's really keeping in conflict is that age of the earth, that calculation that some people try to make with the Bible that, um, you know, how old the earth is, you know, 5,300 years old, something around there. I forget the actual date, um, which we know the earth is 4.8 billion years old. And a lot of people think all religions um, don't want people to learn about evolution. They're against evolution, but it's actually the opposite. Most religions are completely fine with everybody learning about evolution. It's only some religions that take a, uh, a literalist view of the Bible. And that's an issue in all religions. If a literalist view is taken of the religious um, text, um, you can have a lot of conflicts way beyond um, evolution. But I want you to admit, I want you to know the Catholic Church wants you to know about evolution, and they think that it's a great explanation and that you should learn about it. Um, various popes have made statements, um, you know, encouraging uh, everybody to learn about evolution. They happen to just uh, think uh, they believe in something called theistic evolution which basically means that everything was created, you know, by a creator and uh, everything that we see has been set in place by that creator, which is fine. It doesn't prevent you from learning about evolution um, because still in science we're talking about how this stuff works, not why it works. You know, that's in the realm of evolution. So by the 1820s, um, scientists, geologists, they discovered what's called strata of rocks, so different layers, and different layers represent different time periods. Um, flooding, um, erosion, volcanic eruptions, and it could be placed in a time continuum from oldest to youngest. Okay, so you dig the top layer is young, bottom is older, really deep down is the oldest, okay? Hey Jackson. And we're able to date whatever, uh, at least get the relative dating of any fossil found in those layers by where they're found. Um, but also we know the can know very precise um, dating by using radio, um, radiologic dating. Okay, so um, or I'm sorry, radiometric, I'm sorry, radiocellologic metric. 
okay so certain elements that are formed that are in rock when it's formed break down over time into different um, isotopes and those isotopes can be measured and scientists can date how long um, the rock has been around you may have heard about carbon dating because carbon breaks down over time too um, but it's only good for about 5,000 years but these uh, radiometric dating can go back millions and millions of years so it's very effective but what we find is bacteria and algae appear first then fungi then worms later land vertebrates vertebrates um and uh later on um fish were about 420 million years ago and uh i can't really see behind my um little uh thing on with my face on it the little video screen so what's behind that uh amphibian oh yeah amphibians those are 300 40 million years ago, reptiles 320, birds 250, uh, am I missing anything? Yeah, and placent uh, placental mammals 110 million years ago. So you can see these organisms becoming more and more complex as we get closer to the present time. Very simple bacteria and algae worms and then we have uh, move, the movement on the land and we know from the ecology unit we just studied that autotrophs provide energy so you know for the heterotrophs so it would make sense that in the in the oceans you'd have the plants developing first and then on land you would have the land plants developing first okay so plants animals in the oceans and plants developed for animals on land um, and very I love you know flowers um, and how they're pollinated in all these different fascinating ways um, but plant flowering plants developed before insects um, that were um, developed to pollinate them and uh, like I mentioned before we have a lot of these fossil sequences horses armadillos are some of the best um, developed because you don't find all you don't find every fossil you know not everything gets fossilized so this is really cool what do you notice about the horses over time about 16 million years ago until the present what do you notice about the body mass over time you can see it stayed fairly um, steady until about two, 20 million years ago and the body mass went up quite significantly okay horses are huge animals but not always um, and that has to do with whatever climate environment they were in uh, and eventually became advantageous for them to be a lot larger like when I get around a horse I'm like holy moly that's, that's a big animal it's a thousand pounds um, this is pretty cool like if you think like if you first see this what would you what kind of shape would you ascribe uh, to it and I think for me you know it looks like you know branching it's almost like a tree all these different branches some stop little shoots all these little branches and that's what we see in evolution you know one body type you know will split off into two and that'll split off depending some of these body types stay very similar for a long time and then split off or they stay similar for a long time never split like you see crocodiles been around for a long time and look at the geographic distribution we see them originating mostly in North America a little bit in the old world which be Europe and Asia um, and about this time 55 million years ago you had a little a bit of a connection a land bridge most likely between North America and Europe or Asia so you had you know connection between those two land masses but then they those really ancient European horses went extinct while the North American ones persisted and then you had another split into the old world Europe and that went dead too and then another split just amazing to look at evolution of what used to be here if you can go back 
you know, 20, 30 million years ago, you know, what you might find. And then, you know, a whole bunch of different lines of horse evolution that went extinct until finally you have um, the population we have now. So pretty cool, um, especially, you know, showing that um, division between the old world and new world. Um, and that horses primarily are a, uh, you know, North American animal. Um, so we have been manipulating plants and animals to suit our needs for thousands of years. We've been genetically engineering them. I was just in, um, uh, down in, in Cancun, and that's an ancient Mayan area, and they were developing uh, corn um, uh, two, three thousand years ago. Uh, so domestic chicken, corn, uh, cows, pigs, they look very different from their wild ancestors. And artificial selection in humans choose who's going to breed with each other. And you know, what we're doing is selecting traits that we like, um, and then we breed them together. And amazingly, they look, the offspring look, you know, tend to have the traits we're looking for. Um, it's a little more complicated than that, and it's pretty time consuming, um, but it's really effective. And I think what's the coolest is, you know, most dog breeds we think about really haven't been here that long, maybe 120, 130 years, which shows you how effective artificial uh, selection can be, especially when you're looking at changing the appearance of things. And that's what we're usually focused on, things that uh, look different. Oops. You know, and so we have wild chicken, wild pig, and the wild cow, and their modern, um, um, uh, their modern versions that have been domesticated. So if we look at pigs, some differences, you know, the color, horns, you know, the the hair, the body hair is different, much less body hair on those uh, domestic and much thinner, uh, not quite as thick, uh, the, that hair. So chickens, again, the color is different um, and the feathers. And for cows, you know, the color and uh, the uh, we saw the shoulder area. Let me see. Might look at my picture over here. Uh, yeah, on top of the shoulders, um, there's a big bump, and of course the uh, the horns. There's large horns on those uh, on the uh, the wild. And this is pretty cool. Wild rice. This is what it looks like. Wild rice and domesticated. Rice, very different, and wheat. If you look at this wild wheat, teeny tiny kernels. But as we get more domesticated, we get larger kernels. That's really that difference I want you to show. Same thing with corn here. This is wild corn. I mean, you're not going to be putting that on a barbecue um, or spreading butter on it and eating it. Uh, it's just tiny, but some are bigger than others over time. You know, thanks to our Central American friends, they um, developed this larger cob that we now enjoy. That really was the basis of the food system in uh, Central and South America and into North America. So mainly, you know, the size of those kernels and of course the color and um, how the seeds are encased. For example, corn has that um, you know shell over it and in the wild that would not work that would the sprees could the, the seeds couldn't spread um, but since the domesticated one we spread you know it's